Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that thing going to show my time, or do I need to take my own time? Yeah. Okay, cool, great. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm super glad I'm here. I can't really see you because there's a lot of light, so uh, I'm just going to assume that the room is filled with people. Um, um, I'm working for an organization called OCCRP, as you already said. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. You can contact me on Twitter if you want. My name is Jan Strotzig. I'm based in Berlin. You can also ask me for a coffee if, we, uh, uh, if, if you happen to be in Berlin. So uh, always happy to make connections in the, in the OSINT community, especially because we are coming from, or me personally, but also my organization is coming more from a journalistic background. We do a lot of things very similar to the OSINT community, but I don't think that OCCRP as an organization is super well known in this community yet, and uh, we are here to change this. Um, I've brought my colleague Eric, he's uh, somewhere over there in the room. He's also going to have a session later tonight on satellite imagery and geo OSINT, so check this out as well. Um, yeah, OCCRP, what is it actually? So it's a fairly horrible acronym for the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, that's our full name, and it also pretty much describes what we are doing. So we are a journalistic organization, we run our own newsroom, we are very much focused on organized crime reporting, corruption reporting, follow the money investigations, white collar crime, this kind of stuff. Um, we do have our newsroom, as I said, but we also do a lot of investigative uh, support. So we work with local member centers in a number of countries around the world, and we do also have some informal relationships in other countries. In France, for example, we are good friends with the Mont. Uh, in other European countries, we will have other partners that we usually do our stories with and investigate people and companies. Um, the whole organization is around 190 people right now, and that includes uh, uh, administrative staff. Uh, it includes, obviously, the journalists. And then there is a uh, uh, infrastructure team. There's a data and research team, which I happen to be the co-head of. And then there's also a Aleph team. So we have a separate team of software developers taking care of the piece of software that we are going to look at in a second. Um, we are headquartered in Amsterdam as of last year, and OCCRP has been founded 16 years ago now, 15 and a half years ago. So this is, by the way, just a screenshot from our homepage, so you kind of know what we are doing. Um, I think it gives you kind of a good overview, so uh, there's some Russia stuff going up and going on in the corner. Um, we did the Russian asset tracker. I don't know. I don't know if any of you followed this. This is a larger project we did last year, very OSINT heavy. Um, and then sometimes we do uh, investigations, like for example the Swiss secrets, which you see down there, which are leak based. Um, cool. So a lot of the things that we do, especially the long term, larger projects, somehow start with a a kind of leak, right? So uh, ignore the typo, by the way. This is, but this is. Uh, a message that me or my colleague or someone from the team might receive probably like once a week, every other week, I don't know. Um, and um, this is also why I asked the question before about time management. So usually we work with reporters and they are very, very, they need everything urgently, they need everything now or yesterday. And one of the solutions for this uh, is a tool that we use that's called Aleph. Um, this is what the homepage is. is uh, looking like. I'm going to use the session to give you a very brief overview of what Aleph does in theory. Then we are going to jump in, click around a little bit, and then I have a very brief outlook at the end what you can do if you want to spend more time on it, if you want to dive deeper, if you want to figure out the more technical details of it as well. Um, okay, so I stole this image from a presentation that Eric did a while ago. Uh, the data iceberg. So basically, and this is, I guess this is very true for journalistic reporting, but it's it's also true for OSINT um, analysis that, or reports that you do for a client as well. So a lot of the work is what is actually happening be below the waterline here. And what you what you put into your final report, right? And what, you, especially in journalism, where you have to break everything down into easy to understand sentences, easy to understand stories, is the stuff that's happening above the waterline. Um, and um, the idea here, and this is why I, I put this in the presentation, is that Aleph is hopefully going to help you do a lot of what you see below the waterline here. So a lot of the heavy lifting that not necessarily is the shiny part of the, of the work, especially with leaks, but that is going to make it super easy for you to get to what is uh, above the waterline. Um, okay. Two 
concepts are important. Um, if we talk about Aleph, um, I try to keep the theory part <laughs> small, but I want to make a difference between unstructured and structured data because it's going to come up later if we look into the actual tool. Mm, this is not super well defined, but for me, uh, unstructured data, for example, is uh, a bunch of scanned court files from as a PDF, maybe not, not uh, OCR, not computer readable, probably not the best quality, happens a lot, um, or a dump of someone's hard drive or a ransomware leak that was just published on a dark web blog. Um, obviously also Word documents, stuff like this. And then the next two items, I put a question mark here. So we are starting to work more with images as well in Aleph. So right now what Aleph does, it's gonna find text in images, but hopefully in the future, it's gonna be able to find more in images as well. Um, maybe recognize faces, I don't know, uh, working on that. And then obviously also recordings of audio and video is something that you can look at right now, but it's not something that we are gonna really work with in Aleph. It's not the best tool for it, but we are improving it. And then on the other hand, we have uh, structured data, uh, everything tabular basically. So whatever you get from a SQL dump, whatever you get from a scrape of a website that is gonna end up in your database in, um, in a somewhat tabular structured format. Uh, bank transfers play a role in the type of reporting that we do, spreadsheets with company names and ownerships as well. This is something I have an example for in a bit. And then also think a bit outside of the box of things like uh, where did a jet go? Where was a ship at a certain period of, of time? Um, how did it move? Uh, this is something that you can, to a certain degree, also reflect on Aleph as well. Um, okay, so Aleph is based on the idea of putting all of the things that we looked at here into a predefined structured form, the building blocks of Aleph essentially. So. The idea is that whatever you throw at it as a tool, it's gonna somewhat take the information and either automatically or with your help as a user, uh, gonna put into a predefined form. We use a data model that's called the follow the money FDM data model or data schema. Um, and uh, we are doing this, this is what it looks like by the way, it doesn't really, you don't really have to read it, it's just an example of how we, um, how we would map the data. So each of the boxes here is a entity that can be, an entity that can be represented in Aleph. And then each of the um, items below are properties of this specific entity. And whatever you wanna put into Aleph, I'm gonna go back here because I like this image better. Uh, whatever you wanna put in Aleph, you have to put it in the right form and to map it into one of these entities. And this is gonna help you search across multiple leaks at the same time, right? So um, one of the powerful things of Aleph is that because we put it all into a normalized form and everything is in place and every person entity has the birth date in the, in the same format and comparable addresses are gonna be compar to comparable, et cetera, et cetera, it allows you to very quickly uh, search across a number of leaks and also find what we call cross-referencing results. So it will help you figure out if the person that you found in your personal leak that you got also shows up, I don't know, in the UK company house or in a old WikiLeaks data set that we ingested a while ago, stuff like this. Cool. Um, this is important because um, usually when you do like a general search and you just type in a search, um, um, search term in Aleph, you will usually find a lot of hits just because we ingest a number of, of data sets and um, obviously depends on what you search for, but we, we will search for Vladimir Putin in a bit and it will usually get you a lot of results. And then um, because we mapped it into the FDM model, you can then filter it down from there and that will hope, hopefully help you break your results down to something that's more man manageable, <coughs> sorry, more manageable and more relevant. And as a side effect essentially, uh, the other thing that Aleph does quite well is um, gives me as the more the more data savvy person at OCCRP a much better feeling if I give uh, leak access to leaked data uh, to not super techie journalists. So it's gonna just display whatever is in your office file. It's just gonna show you the table that is in an Excel file. You don't have to worry about macros. You don't have to worry about 
<coughs> sorry, don't have to worry about someone opening an, uh, an email inbox leak on their own computer, maybe with a SMTP server configured or something like this, all these nightmare stuff. So um, throwing it into Aleph and then sharing it with the person and hoping that they use it there and look at it there uh, makes me sleep well at night. Cool, okay, so I guess now we uh, jump in and click around a little bit. Do we have any questions so far? Probably not. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, is that okay to read? Yeah? Nobody's complaining? Okay, cool. Um, so if you go to aleph.occrp.org and you create a, an account and you log in, this is essentially what it's gonna look like for you. It's gonna be a little bit different because for this demo, I'm using a demo account. The demo account has some access to data that you as a fresh user won't have. Um, we do have a program where we give, it's, it's tailored for journalists and reporters essentially, but we will also give access to academics or researchers to a number of data sets that we don't necessarily want the the regular public to see, so you can reach out to us um, if you think that's gonna be interesting for you. Um, basically, what you see here is a little bit of a, um, I don't know what you wanna call this, like almost like a Facebook feed of stuff that people gave this specific user access to. Um, so someone called Phil Chamberlain gave access to a number of, uh, I don't know what this is, committee meetings or something. I'm down here, this is my regular account, I edit, uh, I don't know if any of you have been following the Vulcan Files uh, revelations about the uh, Russia-based, um, basically, hacking company. Um, some of the published files I put into Aleph gave access to our users. So this is kind of like your feed here. Um, uh, but I guess what most people came come to this page for is basically the search bar, right? It works like you would expect a search, uh, search bar to work, so I'm gonna just type in Putin because that's our favorite villain. And then it's just gonna go and search across the data that my user now has access to. And it's gonna go find, just search for the string, right? It's just finding anything that has the string Putin in it. Uh, Aleph does one neat thing, which I'm gonna show you if I find an example. Yeah, so uh, I searched for Putin in Latin script, obviously. Um, it did also find Putin in Cyrillic script. It will do similar stuff to um, to Chinese characters or uh, Southeast Asian characters. It will do similar stuff to uh, nicknames, for example, or short versions of a name. So if I, I'm looking into a person called, let's say, Thomas Smith, and I'm searching for Thomas Smith, and I have someone who's called Tom Smith, this will also show up in my search results. So we do a little bit of uh, synonym search as well. And then if I hover my mouse over, it's a nice feature for people like me who don't read Cyrillic. Uh, it's gonna give me a uh, Latin transliteration as well. Okay, so very basic stuff. Uh, remember all the stuff that we are seeing here. Each of this is an entity because Aleph is based on entities. And from the little icon here, I can see what type of entity it is. This is a company, this is a legal entity. There are people somewhere down here. Yeah, this is a person. Um, okay, I can do my basic search here. Um, okay, let me try something else. Okay, so the next thing I can do with, I mean, obviously Putin is not a great search term because it yields too many results. So I can go in and do an advanced search here. So let's say I wanna be, I want to look for, let's do a proximity search, okay. So I wanna look for Vladimir and Putin, but I know that his middle name is Vladimirovich, so I might wanna leave room in between those two. Uh, so this search, I mean, most of you are gonna be familiar with this. This is just gonna give me a, the proximity search. It's, it's uh, equivalent to the tilde. Is it doing it? Huh? Oh, I didn't edit, yeah, sorry. Let's do two. Yeah, okay, now I got it. Okay, it's equivalent to what you can also do in Google and, and other uh, other search engines. So it's doing the tilde too, and you can play around with this. Like, it, it will take most of the common search operators here. So now I find Vladimir, nothing Putin, but also Vladimir, and then whatever two strings or two words, Putin as well. Um, 
cool. This gives me again back a number of things. So why not filter it by entity type as well? Let's go in here. Let's say for some reason I'm only interested in emails uh, and I'm only interested in emails from the Podesta emails. I don't know if any of you remember this. It's been a while ago now. But the Podesta leaks were, was an email leak that uh, came from the, what was its position? Uh, the Democratic Party of the US. Um, okay, so now I've broken it down to 185 results, which is kind of manageable. Um, and let's look at some of these now. So all of these are emails because I filtered by email. So I can click each of them and it's going to give me a little preview. And it's going to render an email probably, hopefully, ra fairly similar to what you expect an email to look like. Uh, this is the preview and I can click through my results here and I can also expand it so it's going to show me the whole thing. So this is what emails look like in Aleph. There's an email text here. Uh, this is a newsletter type of thing, so it's a bit boring. Uh, it's also extracting a number of um, metadata items here. So um, I can go over these. And then uh, if I build my investigation like this, there's a little bookmark feature here as well where I can say, well, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to stash this away for later. Uh, I'm going to go back to my search results. And I don't know. Let's look at the next one. It's the one that's maybe more exciting that doesn't look like a newsletter. They are all very newslettery, maybe because I searched for Vladimir Putin. But he didn't He didn't actually send an email to Podesta. Um, OK, same stuff here. This is what email looks, emails look like. I'm going to bookmark it here. And I can go, can go back to a different investigation. Maybe I'm also interested in Clinton. Oops, there's an N I'm missing here. Um, and then there is, let's go down here. This is a company. I can also bookmark a company. Uh, I can also bookmark a person that has happened to be called Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of how we, this is like the very, very, very basic way of building investigations. And then under bookmarks, there are a number, oh, there are a number here below that I bookmarked earlier, so ignore these. Uh, I can just go through them and just essentially go back, click at them, figure out what, what the information was in there. Mm. Um, there's quite an extensive way of filtering and faceting this here. So uh, I can filter by all of these different types and I can even configure my own little filters if you really want to dig down. There's a lot of options. Um, this is fairly self-explanatory, so I'm going to skip it for today. Uh, another way of approaching another way of approaching the data in Aleph is not on a per search term or per query basis, but all by looking looking at it on a per database basis, right? So, is the screen fine? Sorry, we are good. Okay, cool. Uh, so what I did, I clicked here where it says data sets. Uh, data sets essentially are the uh, is the information that we as OCCRP maintain and organize for our users and we put it into Aleph, we make it accessible. We have a fleet of 150 or so, so uh, uh, scrapers running that will up go and update data. For example, on the first item you see that there's a little, over there here, there's a little uh, update symbol that says this data set is gonna be updated on the, shit, why is it doing this? Oh, I'm stepping on the box, all right, sorry for that. Um, it's updating this on a monthly basis. Some of them are going to be one-off uh, data sets. With the user account that I'm logged in right now, I have access to 434 data sets here. Again, as I said, if you sign up for a fresh account, th this number is going to be much lower. It's going to be around, uh, I guess, 180 at the moment. Uh, but just reach out, out to us, explain what you're trying to do, and we might have the right data set for you as well. Um, okay, cool. So the data sets are categorized or tagged in, in a number of different categories here. Here, so um, I know that a lot of people are interested in leaks, so let's filter down by leaks, and then, I don't know, let's find one. Let's find one that I like. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, most of you will have heard of the organization Distributed Denial of Secrets. They are a collective uh, publishing a lot of hacked and leaked data. This is one of the data sets that they published a while ago. We put it into Aleph, made it searchable for our users. Um, in this case, it's the uh, Anahyan Sheikh of the UAE, the, his private private office essentially, and it was a leak of around 300,000 uh, email in, um, email files. 
so what Aleph is going to do is it's going to basically present you with a little overview page of what the data set contains. Um, this information is automatically extracted on the ingest. So it's going to do a bit of regex to figure out how many bank accounts are there. IBAN numbers are fairly easy to regex. It's going to do the same for phone numbers. It's trying to find addresses. This is based off of, for example, meeting invites. So if I invite you to a meeting, we are assuming that this is happening at a place right now. Uh, all of the meetings are happening on Microsoft Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams. So this is why this is uh, this show, shows up here under address. We should probably change this label here. Um, it's also trying to extract address, uh, sorry, names, people names, company names to a degree. It works okay. Our CEO office is probably not a person, might still be a helpful uh, thing to search for. And then it gives me an overview of uh, what the data set consists of. And basically from here, I can do very similar stuff to what I did before. So there's a second search bar here now, and I know that this person ordered a lot of caviar. So, all right, so I can, I can just search for my search term. This box will take the similar operators, um, search, search operators as we looked at before. And then I can go through Shaikh Anahyan's uh, caviar orders, which is probably interesting to some people, I don't know. Again, these are emails. Uh, let's find one that has an attachment so I can show you how that works. Okay, so it's gonna give me the email text. Uh, this is a thread, no, yeah, it's a thread. There's more text down here. Um, this is in reply to another email, so I can click up and down the email chain more or less. And then I can also go here and figure out what images are attached here. I hope this is safe for work. I have not checked this before. Great, okay, you can buy these bowls, they are expensive. Uh, I don't know, you have to be a shy to understand. Um, cool, this is all fairly theoretic, so I'm trying to show you how we use this in a real investigation now and how it might give you an advantage in a situation when, where you need to find information fairly quickly. Um, let's go back here, just a couple of slides. So this is, um, this is uh, an image from St. Petersburg in April uh, 2023, the, a cafe, let's just assume at this point you know that a cafe was hit by the explosion and you are reading a news report and it's giving you, this is an investigation that my colleague Oksana did, it's giving you the information that the cafe on the bank of the Neva River was hit by the explosion, right? So this is kind of like a, um, um, like a breaking news situation and you want to figure out what's, what's going on here. So you figure out that it's at the Neva Bank and you get some extra information as well. It was fairly clear at this point uh, after, after, after a short time where in the city this was going to be. So you figure out that it's the street food bar number one, right? This is just a Google screenshot, obviously. Um, but there's interesting information for us on this. So this is in German because my uh, Google account is in German. So it gives you a it gives you a domain, it gives you the domain, and this is also obviously going to be helpful. So what are we going to do? Hope that works now. We're going to go run the who is on it, and it's going to give us a taxpayer ID in this case. Obviously, this is a very uh, good example because the information is there. It's not always there for domains, but for in this case, it was actually there. This is a real world example. So. Um, we find that uh, there's an organization that registered this specific domain, so we can assume that the, the organization is tied to slash owning the restaurant where the bombing um, took place. The taxpayer ID in Russia is essentially the company registration ID, so it's very helpful. So I'm just gonna copy it. Um, I'm gonna go move over to Aleph and just uh, throw it in here and then we see. Okay, great. So we learned from the other screen here that the company was called Concord as well. So we are on the right track here. Let's go down a little bit maybe, or maybe filter by data set. So I know that we have the Russian, uh, the basically equivalent of a company registry in here. So I can filter by that and there we go. This is the company behind it. This is the same and I can hover over it. It's gonna help me figure out as a non-Cyrillic reader that this is actually the exact same company, Concord M. Okay, so I can go click it. I'm gonna expand it. Uh, it gives me some information about the director, not super interesting. There's also some assets, so the company itself owns 50% of another company, but I'm mostly interested in this step. So this is the ownership of the company, and I can see that 10% are owned by another company, 
and then 90% are owned by a person, and I'm interested in this person, and hey, it happens to be Prigozhin, okay? So this is the guy who uh, is the owner and use, or used to be the owner, I should say no, of the Wagner um, uh, private army, uh, and who made a little, went for a little walk towards Moscow last weekend, so, um, and this is super interesting, we are essentially two minutes after reading about the attack, right? After figuring out where it happened, let's say. Um, so that's probably an interesting piece of news for our investigation, but we can probably find more. As I said in the beginning, so I'm back at the company profile now. Um, as I said in the beginning, Aleph is gonna go search across a number of data sets, not only the one. So this is the unified state register, the e rule in, Russian, in Russia. It's also gonna search for the company in other data sets. This happens under the similar tab or on a data set basis, there's, a, there's gonna be a tab that's called XREF, cross-reference. So it found 70 similar occurrences of this company. So the same company happens to be in a number of different data sets. So, okay, this is cool. We can see which data sets these are. Uh, it seems to be sanctioned, that's interesting, but I'm more interested in the Russian public procurement data. So I can go here and I can find that this is the same company again. It has the same ID and I can expand it and then I'm gonna, <coughs> sorry. And then I, I'm gonna find almost 200 of uh, public procurement contracts. So the company that owns the cafe where the bomb went up in St. Petersburg uh, has uh, been awarded 197 contracts by the Russian state. And we are, I don't know how long, how long this took, but we are like five minutes in our research on this company. So this is kind of like a real world example, and I'm gonna stop here now. Uh, of how we would use the search part of Aleph in our normal investigations. Um, I don't know what any of these means, to be honest, but it's probably very interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, are we doing on time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the... This is essentially the passive part of Aleph, what I, I just showed you. And hidden under the little tab up here, which is called investigations, is the more active part of Aleph. So investigations for us is whatever the user does, right? Data sets, OCCRP handles, investigations, your, your private upload space where you can put your own data into Aleph. You can reference it against the data sets that you have access to. You can create entities from spreadsheets, for example. And we are gonna try this now. So I'm just gonna create a new entity. I'm just, uh, sorry, a new investigation. Demo le hack, why not? Gonna say that this is in French because I'm, this is just relevant for the, for the OCR process. So if I happen to upload documents in uh, that are not com uh, uh, OCR, then it's gonna use this flag to speed up the process a little bit. Um, this looks kind of similar to what we looked at at the data set side, just it's empty right now because we haven't added any, any data yet. So I'm just gonna go here. I'm just gonna pick a number of things. So I prepared a couple of CSV files, also a zip file. We're just gonna throw it in. Let's see what happens. Oops, okay, now we're good. Okay, so um, this is gonna take a few minutes and then Aleph is gonna process the files. Um, I use the zip file here to show you that you can essentially throw most of the data types at it and it's just gonna, so in the case of the zip file, it's just unpacking the, the, the zip file. It's gonna show me what's in there. It's the same email that we looked at before or one of the caviar requests because I like this example. And then it's also a copy of my passport, which it's not really, I took a screenshot because I didn't want to dox myself here, but um, <laughs> just as an example, so this could be my passport and it would go in and do some uh, OCR on the image. Uh, you can read the text now, hopefully. And it's gonna do, oops, sorry. It's gonna process the email that was in the zip file as well in a similar way. So now I have an email, it has an attachment, all this is available to me now. So this is, I guess, much more comfortable than just working with uh, archives on my computer. Um, but the actual powerful thing is, um, hard refresh here for a sec. Okay, here we are, the CSV files are here. The actual powerful thing is, and th this is what we do a lot in our investigations, is that you can start collecting data on companies and on people in a certain way and then Aleph is gonna help you 
uh, map this into actual entities in Aleph that you, you can work with then. So let's look at one of the uh, CSV files here. So this, this is kind of fairly classical stuff that we do. So you have a company name, you have some information on the company jurisdiction, incorporation date, and then you have a column about the ownership of the company. There's a person owning the company. By the way, all this data, I mostly made it up or copied it from somewhere else, so don't worry about the content of this. Um, the owner might have a passport number or some other identification uh, information, like a birth date, nationality, and they may own a number of shares. So this is cool. I have it in my table. Not very user-friendly, not very readable, very hard to figure out. Like Laura Smith, uh, Laura Miller is here like one, two, three. Like she's on my screen like five times and I don't really know, like I can't really immediately see what she's owning or not owning. So, oops, sorry, the one thing that I can do in Aleph and that's pretty neat is I can generate entities from that. And it, um, it's gonna guide me through this. So I know that in my spreadsheet, there are companies, right? And let's just, so the keys are gonna define which of these is a unique entity. So a company might have a name and a uh, incorporation date, which is fairly good. Like there's probably not the same company with the same name and same in incorporation date, but a different company in the world. So let's just use this. And then I know that there's also a person here. Oop. There we go. And for the person, obviously, the name is great. And then, I don't know, passport ID is super cool, super unique. OK, and then these two have a relationship. In this case, as I know from my spreadsheet, it's going to be ownership. And then let me scroll over. I'm on a trackpad here that's a bit hard to navigate. So the person owns the company. And then I can go down here. I can assign the, basically, what I'm doing here is, and I'm, it's nicely color coded. It's fairly straightforward. I'm, going to be able to figure out which column holds which information. Uh, this is, what is it? Incorporation date. This is person name. Person. Where's passport? There we go. We do have a person. Date of birth here. Nationality. And then this is uh, information about the ownership itself. So it's not the person or the company, it's the value of the shares. Okay, cool. So this is my original table. I've now kind of color coded and mapped the information in my table. And then I can go down here and I can click generate entities. Um, I can do the same thing now on the other CSV files. It's gonna take a while. It's gonna be boring for all of you. So I did it yesterday and I'm just gonna skip over to the other tab where the process is already done. So depending on the size of your spreadsheet, this is gonna take, I don't know, like three to 30 minutes to run. So I don't wanna let you wait. And what's gonna happen is that Aleph is gonna basically go across all my spreadsheets that I mapped out in a nice way. And it's going to figure out um, which people show up in multiple of these spreadsheets, which companies show up in multiple of these spreadsheets. So for example, one of the spreadsheets, I can go back here, so the one that we just looked at had company information and ownership information of the company. And then this one has the same companies and bank account information. So in this spreadsheet, I have information about a bank account and then the companies, and these are gonna be the same companies as in the other spreadsheet, and they might own a bank account. So this gives me a data set, which is much more user-friendly and much more easy to search. Uh, what I can do now is I can go here, click on Laura Miller. I have a little profile of this person now. Uh, it did expand all the information from the other spreadsheet, right? So we have a passport number here. We have the source data, where, di where does the information come from? And we also can immediately see that she's the owner of nine companies here, right? So each of these are gonna have extra information as well. She owes a thousand shares here or shares worth uh, whatever. The currency is a thousand dollars. And then I can also go uh, visualize this in a different way. So people love network diagrams. So I can throw this into a network diagram and I can then, once it's loading, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so this is Laura Miller again, move her over here. She's owning a couple of companies. Sorry, made a mistake here. It's pretty hard to handle on a, on a trackpad. I like a mouse. So she's owning a number of companies here. And then these companies, some of them might be owned by multiple people. So I can see that this one, for example, is also owned by Kelly Miller. 
and then I can either go work on my spreadsheet again, import it again, or I can also go in here and I can then just say, uh, I wanna add a new entity and I'm gonna add myself now. Oh wait, no, sorry, wrong, wrong interface. I have to, uh, have to do it here, people, sorry. Uh, there we go, I can add myself here. And I can work from here and then I can make myself, if we go back to the network diagram, I can make myself the owner of one of these companies as well. <coughs> so it's processed now, there I am. Okay, cool, make myself green, cause why not? <coughs> and I'm linked to, uh, why not? Blue Moon sounds great. I'm the owner of Blue Moon, okay. I have a connection to this company now. And you can kind of work from the network diagram or you can also do this in bulk if you collect thousands of companies and work from the, or whatever information you collect and work from the, uh, the spreadsheet view as well. Uh, there is a, this is kind of the last part of my demo here. There is a feature doing this in a timeline uh, way as well. This is experimental at this point. Let's find a better one bigger one okay this one's good so uh, most of the no, most of the entities I guess all of the entities actually will have a way of recording a, a temporal property so it's either a birth date or incorporation date start and date of relationships stuff like this you can for most of them you can record some form of temporal uh, property and then there's a feature we are still building this out this is kind of a, a, a better feature where you will have a possibility to look at a timeline of your events as well. So Donald Trump, oh shit, Donald Trump was born somewhere over there and then stuff ha didn't happen for a long time <laughs> because he's very old. Uh, someone else was born here, Putin, okay, great. Let's move, I can switch to years. It's gonna make life easier. Okay, Putin was married for a while. He got divorced. There happened something in the Crimean bridge, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of imagine what this is gonna be useful for as well. Um, cool, this is the demo part. Uh, I'm quickly gonna go back to show you what's the time saying. Okay, I started a little bit late, Sylvan, so right? Okay, um, I, I have like three more slides and then uh, we have time for a little bit of questions. Uh, I just quickly wanted to point out that Aleph as a tool is a open source software. You can go take it, uh, uh, you can, um, uh, you can fork it on GitHub, work, in, uh, work on it yourself, create all the features you want. There's a f hopefully fairly supportive community around it. We do have a Slack channel if you're interested in the development part of it. Uh, we are fairly active on GitHub as well. Um, and you can add all your personal data into your instance as well. It's obviously gonna come without data if you s host it yourself. And then in contrast, and what we looked at before now is the instance that we host at aleph.ocrp.org. It's public facing, it's open for everyone. We are mostly, as I said, catering to the journalistic and investigative reporter community, but we are very open to OSINT people as well. Um, so if you want to use it, if you want to try it out, just go there, sign up for an account. Uh, maybe get in touch if you're interested in a specific topic. Maybe we, we might have data to help you with. We might be able to give you access to some stuff that you don't initially see. Uh, we have literally billions of entities in Aleph right now, which, <laughs> which is turning into a little bit of a problem because it's not perf the performance sometimes is, could be better, but we are also working on this. As I said, we have a number of scrapers that will provide you with fresh data from company registries, from uh, procurement databases, et cetera, et cetera. And you also have your space to upload your personal data there. And your friends might maybe already be there. I didn't really talk about the sharing feature, but you can share access to your investigations to other users as well. And they will just be able to work in your investigation. Or you can share view access as well, so they will only be able to see what you're doing. By default, whatever you put into Aleph is not gonna, visible to, uh, gonna be visible to any other users as well uh, on the platform. Uh, if you wanna start building stuff around Aleph, which we obviously encourage. Uh, it's fairly flexible, there's an API. Um, it does come with a framework, it's called Memorius, the scraping framework. It does come with a Python library and a command line wrapper for it. So if you have large data, large amounts of data that you wanna ingest, you don't have to obviously go through the website and drag and drop it. And the FDM model, the underlying data model works well with 
some other tools as well, or if you are looking for something to uh, build uh, a database on or something, I, I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, this is, by the way, just to end on a bit of a nerdy end here. This is what a scraper would look like in Aleph. So the Mem Memorias framework basically consists of two, mm, well, two parts basically on the right hand side here. This is the abstract, uh, it's a YAML file. It's the abstract um, instruction set for the scraper. So in this case, it's, it's text data from Azerbaijan. So this is our way of naming things. Um, and then what it's going to do, it's going to, there's, there's an init phase and then the ser search phase, and they are going to be corresponding to a little bit of Python code. Uh, so we have a init function here, and then there's going to be search function somewhere down there. And this probably goes on for like another 50 or so lines, but it's not super huge. Like you don't, for most of the websites, you don't have to write immense scrapers to get the stuff into Aleph. Um, a shameless plug, we are also hiring a cybercrime <laughs> journalist right now, so if you are interested in working with journalists and reporters, if you have uh, seen, if you have opened the Tor browser before, if you have, I don't know, tracked uh, transactions on a blockchain or something, please uh, go to our website, look at our job ad. Uh, that's it from my end. We have four minutes for questions. We have more than four minutes. Oh, we have more than four minutes. Yeah. I'm going to uh, eat into your lunch break then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. So, do we have some questions yet? Here. Is it uh, thank you for the talk. I um, was just wondering, uh, I, I can imagine uh, some uh, people are not very happy with all the data that is on here. So, do you get like attacks, I don't know, from government or maybe the Sheikh is not happy that in, you know about his caviar consumption? Some yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> um, uh, yes, but this is like, okay, so the, this is mo probably more a problem for the reporting that we do at OCCRP and not so much for the, the data repository and the other the stuff that we do. So we get attack, not only atta cyber attacks, but also more legal attacks, like lawyers sending us threatening letters and stuff. It's a thing, but um, the, the, so Aleph as a tool is, to my knowledge, not DDoS a lot. I mean, it goes down every now and then, but it's usually our fault, so. <laughs> uh, we do have legal, uh, we do have, well, legal battles, I should say, over which data we can have and which people we can get access to. This is also why it's kind of compartmentalized a little bit. So as I said, if you sign up, there's gonna be a, a reduced, data, uh, reduced set of data, uh, data and information that you can see. And then if we trust you and if we think you're doing it in the, as a journalist or as a researcher, we will give you access to more. This is mostly due to legal reasons because we, uh, we don't want to get sued. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a great tool and thank thanks you. for the work that you are doing on Aleph. Um, yes. I have one question regarding the OCR. Um, how good is the OCR and how do you deal with false positive uh, with the um, grammatical detections when words are converted into something else? Um, well, we're using Tesseract, so it's an open source library. It's fairly, uh, it's working well on a number of languages. It's not great on some other languages, I would say. It obviously depends a lot on the quality of your document, right? And then uh, I would say our general approach is to show the user in terms of false positives, is to show the user rather more and have them decide themselves that they are looking at a crap result is to kind of hold back things. So as it, I don't know if you remember the example where it has like CEO office as a person. Obviously it's not a person and we would probably be able to kind of filter it out manually and go in and have like a blacklist of words that we don't want to show up in the person's list because they keep coming up. But then again, it's just, I don't know, you look at 10 names and like you immediately see that one of them is a false positive, so it's kind of fine. This is not like the fine, this is the beginning of the journey for the investigation, it's not the end, it's not that, that you, s that you stop there and you kind of take it word by word and write it down as a reporter. A bit of a technical question. You use uh, all of the money ontology inside yes. OSSRP Aleph, and in this ontology, you divide entities into taxonomies of things and intervals. Yes. What was the logic behind intervals? 
because if I'm not mistaken, you are uh, defining each entity in the intervals taxonomy uh, based on uh, the start date and an end date of uh, each uh, interaction. But some of uh, uh, the connections between entities don't have these attributes. Uh, you don't need a start date and an end. So intervals is basically FDM speak for connections, right? In 99% of the cases. Uh, you don't need a start date and an end date. You need a uh, subject and object for the relationships. So for a ownership relationship, you need the owner and the asset that's being owned. Uh, you don't necessarily need the start and end date. Uh, I don't know where, uh, so this was before my time, so FDM is older than my time at OCCRP. I don't know why the why there was a decision made uh, to basically have a set of entities and intervals, but um, it's, it's us faking uh, graph data, I would say. <laughs> it's not a graph database, but it's kind of trying to be a bit graphy and um, uh, the way that we uh, use the intervals also works like ed edges and nodes a little bit. 